Good Friday morning, MAB Elementary. This is Mr. T for Literature Group. And we're continuing our adventure story of the incredible journey by Sheila Burnford. You may recall, and this is gonna be chapter nine, at the end of chapter eight was a happy occasion where our three adventurers were uh, rejoined by the cat. The old dog had his beloved cat warm and purring between his paws again, and he snored in deep contentment. The young dog, their gently worried leader, had found his charge again. He, continu he could continue with a lighter heart. So that's positive. Good development. Let's see how it goes. Chapter 9. Over 200 miles <clears throat> now lay behind them. Oh my goodness, they've gone 200 miles. <clears throat> and as a group, they were whole and intact, but of the three, only the cat remained unscathed. The old dog, however, still plodded cheerfully and uncomplainingly along. It was the Labrador who was in, re who was in really poor condition. His once beautiful gleaming coat was harsh and staring and staring now. His grotesquely swollen face in horrible contrast to his gaunt frame and the pain in his infected jaw made it almost impossible for him to open his mouth so that he was virtually starving. Whew, this is a bad situation. The other two now, now allowed him first access to any newly killed and bleeding animal provided by the cat and he lived so, solely on the fresh blood that could be licked from the carcass. They had slipped into a steady routine during the day, the two dogs trotting along side by side, unconcerned and purposeful, <clears throat> might have seen two family pets out for a, near, a neighborhood ramble. They were, they were seen like this one morning by a tiny, by a timber cruising forester, uh, this is uh, one of the guys who was responsible for managing the timber, the forest resources in Canada. Uh, a timber cruising forester returning to his jeep along an old tote road deep in the Iron Mouth Range. It must be a mountain range. They disappeared around a bend in the distance and preoccupied with his tree problems, he did not give them a second thought. It was a considerable shock that he remembered them later on in the day, his mind now registering the fact that there, were, that there was no human habitation within 30 miles. He told the senior forester who roared with laughter, then asked him if he had seen any elves skipping around the toadstools too. So he made fun of him because he said, you can't possibly see two dogs and a cat 30 miles out into the wilderness. But inevitably the time was drawing nearer when the disappearance of the animals was uncovered. The hue and cry begin, and every glimpse or the smallest piece of evidence would be of value. The forester was able to turn that the laughed a week later when his chance encounter was to prove to be no dream. Ah, so this is the first kind of positive development uh, or the but sort of a prediction that our author is giving us that this might turn out okay. Let's see. <laughs> At Heron Lake, John Longbridge, you remember him, and his brother were making plans for the last trip of the season. In England, the excited Hunter family was packed in readiness for their voyage home back to the United States. Mrs. Oakes was busy in the old stone house cleaning and polish polishing while her husband stacked the wood cellar. By the way, I misspoke. Uh, the Hunter family is coming back to Canada, not the United States, North America. Soon, all concerned would be back where they belong, like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle being fitted together. And soon, it must be discovered that three of the pieces were missing. Sublimely unaware of the commotion and worry, tears and heartbreak their absence would cause, the three continued on their way. The countryside was less wild now, and once or twice they saw small, lonely hamlets in the distance. The young dog resolutely avoided these, keeping always to the woods in the dense brush wherever possible, much to the disgust of the old dog who had an implicit faith in the helpfulness and loving kindness of human beings. But the young dog was the leader. However longingly the bull terrier looked towards the distant curl of smoke from a chimney, he must turn away. Late one afternoon they were followed by several miles they were followed for several miles by a single timber wolf 
who was probably curious about the cat and no real menace, however hungry. It would never have risked the encounter with the two dogs. Like all of his kind, however, the young dog hated and feared the wolf with some deep primal instinct that must have had its origin in those mists of time when they shared a common ancestor. Ooh, that's a cool sentence. I'll read it again. Like all of his kind, however, the young dog hated and feared the wolf with some deep primal instinct which must have had its origin in those mists of time when they shared a common ancestor. He was uneasy and disturbed by the slinking gray shape that merged into the undergrowth every time he looked back to snarl at it. Unable to shake off the hateful shadow and aware that the sun was sinking, irritable, irritable and exhausted with pain, he cho chose the lesser of two evils, leaving the bush for a quiet country road with small farms scattered at lonely intervals along it. He hurried his companions on, seeking prote protection for the night in the form of a barn or even an open field near a farm, sensing that the wolf would not follow within sight of human habitation. Habitation means uh, where humans live. Excuse me. <clears throat> Mr. T's allergies continue. Sorry. They approached a small hamlet at dusk, a few small houses cl clustered around a, sp a schoolhouse and a white framed church. When the young dog would have skirted, th skirted this too, the old terrier suddenly turned mutinous. Mutinous means to, uh, to disagree with the command order from the, from the young dog and it goes his own way. <clears throat> he was, as usual, hungry, and the sight of the warm light streaming out of the houses convinced him that this evening there was only one sensible way of obtaining food from the hand of a human being. His eyes brightened at the thought, and he ignored the young dog's warning growl and trotted on unheeding down the forbidden road towards the houses. His round porcine quarters swinging defiantly, his eyes laid back, his ears laid back in stubborn disregard. The young dog offered no further resistance. His whole head was throbbing violently with pain of the infection from the quills of the porcupine. And more than anything, he wanted time to scratch and scratch to rub the burning cheek around, along the ground. The rebel passed the, few, uh, the first few cottages, so snug and inviting to his comfort-loving soul, smoke rising in the still evening air and the reassuring smell and sounds of humans everywhere. He paused before a small white cottage, snuffing <clears throat> ecstatically, very happily, ecstatic means to be happy, the wonderful aroma of cooking drifting out, mingling with wood smoke. Licking his chops, he walked up the steps, lifted a bold, demanding paw, and scratched on the door, and then sat down, perking his, his ears expectantly. He was not disappointed. A widening stream of light from the opening door revealed a small girl. The old dog grinned <coughs> uh, hideously in pleasure. Uh, his slant eyes blinking strangely in the sudden light. There was a little, <clears throat> there was little to equal the bull terrier's grin, however, charmingly presented for sheer astonishing ugliness. <laughs> and our pretty dogs. <clears throat> there was a moment's silence followed by an urgent wail of, Dad! Then the door slammed shut in his face. Puzzled but persistent, he scratched again, cocking his head to one side, his big triangular ears erect listening to the footsteps scurrying around within. A face appeared at the window. He barked a polite reminder. Suddenly the door was thrown open again and a man rushed out, a bucket of water in his hand, his face convulsed, convulsed in fury. He hurled the water full in the face of the astonished dog and then grabbed the broom. Get out of here, get out of here, yelled the man, brandishing his broom so menacingly that the terrier tucked his tail between his legs and fled, soaking and miserable, towards his waiting companions. He was not afraid, only deeply offended. Never in his long life had a human being reacted in such a way to his friendly overtures. Justifiably, justifi justifiable fury he knew <clears throat> and expected when he was terrorizing their pets in the old days. Laughter and sometimes nervousness, but never a crude, uncivilized reception like this. Baffled and disappointed, he, <clears throat> he fell meekly in behind the leader. Two miles along the road, they came to a, wind, to a winding cart track 
leading uphill to a farm. They crossed the dark fields, startled up a old white horse and some cows, heading for a group of outbuildings clustered together some distance from the farmhouse. <clears throat> a thin curl of smoke rose from the chimney of one of them. It was a smokehouse where hams were smoking over a slow hickory fire. That's a special way of cooking meat where you just smoke it uh, and it dries it out and gives it a lot of flavor. I don't know if you've ever had any smoked meats, but it can be really delicious. Especially if uh, it, it's, uh, the, the farmer is smoking it with hickory wood, which has a great scent. Pressed against the faint warm at the base of the chimney, they settled down for the night. The young dog spent a restless night. The running sores on its face had been extended by its continuous frantic clawing into the raw inflamed patches over the glands on one side of his neck, and the spreading infection was making him feverish and thirsty. Whew, it's not good. Several times he left others to drink from a small lake a short distance away, standing chest deep in the cool, soothing water. When the old dog woke shivering with cold, he was all alone. The cat was some distance away, belly to ground, tail twitching excitedly, stalking his breakfast. Stealing through the morning air came a familiar smell of smoke and something cooking, beckoning irresistibly. The mists were rolling back from the valley and the pale sun was lighting the sky when the old dog came down the windbreak of tall Norway pine trees and down outside the farmhouse door. His memory was short, already human beings were back on their rightful pedestals, cornucopias of dog food in their hands. <clears throat> Cornucopia is a whole bounty full of good things to eat. He whined pl plaintively. Plaintively means beggingly. That's a great adjective, uh, adverb. He whined how? He whined plaint plaintively. <clears throat> at a second louder whine, several cats appeared from the barn nearby and glared at him with tiger-eyed resentment. At any other time, he would have put them <clears throat> to instant flight. Now he had more pressing business and chose to just ignore them. The door swung open, a wondrous smell of bacon and eggs surged out, and the terrier drew up all the heavy artillery of his charm. With an ingratiating wag of his tail, he glued his ears back and wrinkled his nose in preparation for a disastrous whining leer. There was an astonished silence broken by a deep, musing voice of a man. Well, said the owner of the voice, surveying his old, odd visitor, whose eyes were now rolled back so far that they were had almost disappeared in his head. He called into the house and was answered by a pleasant, warm voice of a woman. There was a sound of footsteps. The tail increased its tempo. The woman stood for a moment in the doorway, looking down in silent astonishment at the white gargoyle on the steps. And when he saw her face break into a smile that past master in the art of, scr of scrounging prof proffered a civil paw. A couple words there, gargoyles. Gargoyles are those made out of concrete, uh, fantastic uh, creatures uh, on, the, um, on the tops of Gothic churches all over the, uh, the ancient world in Europe. And they're the downspout uh, where the water comes out uh, from the roof, gargoyles. Uh, they're uh, mythical uh, creatures of various shapes and, and sizes. The other word here that's interesting is um, proffered. The art of uh, the art of scrounging proffered. Proffered means to offer forward. A civil paw. Civil means uh, re respectful. She bent down and shook it, laughing helplessly. Then invited him to follow her into the house. Dignified, the old dog walked in, gazed at the stove with bland confidence. He was in luck this time, for there could not have been pleasanter people or more welcoming house for miles around. They were an elderly couple, James McKenzie and his wife Nell, living alone now in a big farmhouse which they had held, which still held the atmosphere of a large, cheerful family living and laughing and growing up in it. They were well used to dogs, for there had been eight children in the house once upon a time, and a consequent succession of pets, who had always starred, <clears throat> started their adopted life out in the yard, but invariably found their way into the household on the wildest pretexts of the children. Misunderstood mongrels, often kittens and stray cats, abandoned otter, uh, otter 
outer pups, Neil McKenzie's soft heart had been as defenseless before them as it was now. In other words, Mrs. McKenzie just had a soft heart for animals. Mr. T's kind of like that. A lot of people like that. We just love animals and we try and take care of them whenever we can, we have an opportunity. She gave the visitor a bowl of scraps, which he bolted down in ravenous gulps, looking up then for some more. Why, he's starving, she exclaimed in horror and contributed her own breakfast. She petted and fussed over him, accepting him as though, he, as though the years had rolled back and one of her children had brought home yet another half-starred stray. He basked to in this attention, emptied the bowl almost before it reached the ground. Without a word, Mrs. McKenzie, McKenzie passed over his plate as well, and soon the toast was gone too, and the jug of milk, and at last, distended and happy, the old dog stretched out on a rug by the warmth of the stove while Nell cooked another breakfast. What is he? she asked presently. I've never seen anything quite so homely. He looks as though he's been squeezed into the wrong coat somehow. He's an English bull, her husband said, and a beauty too, a real old bruiser. I love them. He looks as though he's been in a fight quite recently, yet he must be 10 or 11 if a day. And at the unqualified respect and admiration in his voice, so dear to the heart of the bull terrier, but so seldom forthcoming, the dog thumped his tail agree agreeably then rose and thrust his bony head against his host's knee. Mackenzie looked down, chuck, chuckling appreciatively. As cocksure as a devil and as irresistible, aren't you? But what are we going to do with you? Hmm. Nell passed a hand over the dog's shoulder and felt the scars and then examined them more closely. She looked up, suddenly puzzled. These aren't from any dog fight, she said. They're claw marks, like the ones bears leave on fresh wood, only smaller. Boy, she's a pretty smart lady, isn't she? In silence, they looked down the dog by their feet, digesting the implications, the unknown story behind the sinister scars. And they saw now, for the first time, the gathering cloudiness in the depths of the humorous little eyes, the too thin neck, shamed by the newly distended belly. And they saw that the indefagable, means untireable tail, which thumped so happily on the floor was ragged and old with a broken end. This was no bold, aggressive adventure, only a weary old dog, hungry not only for food, but for affection. There was no shadow of doubt in either of what they would do. They would keep him if he would stay and give him what he needed. Boy, lucky, huh? They searched unfailingly under the white coat and the pink ears for any identifying registered tattoo and decided that when Mackenzie went into deep water, must be the little town nearby, to fetch some new churns later in the day, he would make some inquiries there and tell the provincial police and possibly put an advertisement in the city newspaper. And if nothing came of that, well, then I guess we're landed, <clears throat> we, we're landed with you for good, you disreputable old hobo, said McKenzie cheerfully, <clears throat> prodding uh, his delightful audience with an experienced foot so that the dog rolled over on his back with a blissful sigh and invited further attention under his forearms, forearms. When he opened the door that morning, Mackenzie had seen a flight of mallard ducks going down in the direction of the small lake fed by the creek running through the farm. It was still early enough to walk over to see if they were still there, so he put his, a handful of shells in his pocket, took down his old pump shotgun from the wall and set off, leaving Nell ste <coughs> stepping over and around the recumbent white form of their guest as she cleared the table. He noticed that an infinitesimal slit of an eye followed her every movement. Infinitesimal infinity. Uh, in this case, infinitesimal means small infinity. So the, the terrier was just watching her through a slit in his eye. Halfway over the still misty fields, <clears throat> Mackenzie stopped to load his gun and then walked quietly towards the cover of the Adlers fringing the little lake. Peering through the branches, he saw six mallards about halfway across, just out of range. When the wind, <clears throat> with the wind the way it was, he might wait all day for a shot unless something startled them from the other side. But even as he turned away, he saw a disturbance in the reeds across the water. 
Simultaneously quacking loudly in alarm, the mallards took off in a body. He fired twice as they came over, one bird plummeting into the water and the other landing with a thud on the shore nearby. He picked this one up thinking that he would have to bring the light canoe for the other. When he saw, to his astonishment, a large head of a dog sw swimming towards the downed duck. The sound of a shot and the splash of a duck had the same effect on the Labrador as a trumpet call to an old war horse and drew him irresistibly. See, the Labradors are trained to be hunters, uh, retrievers. Labrador, Lab Labrador retriever is their full name. And uh, because hunters have had to shoot uh, birds, ducks, for example, uh, to put meat on the table, uh, you needed some kind of a, you needed a dog to go out and swim in the lake and retrieve, bring back any duck that was shot down in the water and bring it back to the, uh, to the hunter so he could take it home and, and uh, have it for a meal. So, without a second's hesitation, he had plunged in for the retriever only to find that he was unable to open his mouth to grasp the heavy duck properly and was forced to tow it ashore by just a wingtip. Remember, his jaw is all infected and he can't grip the duck, the down duck, uh, the way he, his instinct would tell him uh, how to do it. But he dragged it to the shore. He emerged from the water 20 feet from the man, the beautiful green head of the duck trailing from its outstretched wing the sun striking the iridescent plumage. The Labrador looked doubtfully at the stranger and Mackenzie stared back in open mouth amazement. For a moment, the two were frozen in a silent tableau like a picture. Then the man recovered himself. Good dog, he said, quietly holding out one hand. Well done, now bring it to me. The dog advanced hesitantly, dragging the bird. That's his instinct to do that. Give, Mackenzie said as the dog still hesitated. The dog walked slowly forward, releasing his hold, and now Mackenzie saw with horror that one side of his face was swollen out of all proportion. The skin scratched so taut that the eyes were mere slits, and one rigid lip pulled back over the teeth, sticking out like evil little pins on the rounded cushion of raw skin were several quills deeply embedded. Every rib showed under his wet coat, and when the dog shook himself, Mackenzie saw him stagger. Wow. Labrador's in bad shape, and Mackenzie knows that. Mackenzie made up his mind quickly. No matter whose, this dog was desperately in need of urgent treatment. The quill, quills must be extracted at once before the infection spread further. He picked up the ducks, patted the dog's head reassuringly, and then heal, he said firmly. To his relief, the dog fell in behind unquestioningly, followed him back to the farmhouse, <clears throat> his resistance weakened to the point where he longed only to be back in the well-ordered world of human beings, that solid world where men commanded and the dogs obeyed. Great sentence. Crossing the fields, the stranger paddled trustingly at his heels. Mackenzie suddenly remembered the other dog and frowned in bewilderment. How many more unlikely dogs in need of succor would he lead into the farmhouse kitchen today? A lame poodle this afternoon? Uh, a, a halt beagle tonight? His long, early morning shadow, <coughs> his long early morning shadow fell over the wood pile and the sleepy Siamese cat sunned, sunned himself there, there, lay camouflaged by stillness as he paused, as he passed unobserved by the man but acknowledged by the dog with a brief movement of his tail and head. So the Labrador saw the cat, but the man didn't. Mackenzie finished cleaning up the Labrador's face nearly an hour later. He had extracted the quills with a pair of pliers. One had worked its way into the mouth and had to be removed from within, but the dog had not growled once, only whimpering when the pain was most intense, and had shown pathetic gratitude when it was over, trying to lick the man's hands. Oh. The relief must have been wonderful for the punctures were now draining freely and already the swelling was subsiding. All through the operation, the door leading out the kitchen to the back room had shaken and rattled to the accompaniment of piteous whining. 
The old dog had been so much in the way when Mackenzie was working, pushing against his hand, and obviously worried that he was going to do his companion some harm, that Nell had finally enticed him out with a bone and then quickly shut the door on his unsuspecting face. Now, still deeply suspicious of foul play, he was hurling himself against the door with all of his weight, but they did not want to let him in yet until the other dog had finished a bowl of milk. Mackenzie went to wash his hands and his wife listened to the anxious running feet and thuds that followed until she could bear it no longer, certain that he would harm himself. She opened the door and the old dog shot out like a fury, prepared to do battle on behalf of his friend. But he drew up all, stand he drew up all standing, a comical puzzled expression on his face as he saw him peacefully lapping up a bowl of milk. Presently, they sat down by the door and the young dog patiently suffered the attentions of the other. It was evident by their recognition and devotion that they had come from the same home, a home which did not deserve to have them, said Neil angrily, still upset by the gaunt, gaunt travesty of a, dog, uh, of a dog that had appeared. But Mackenzie pointed out that they must have known care and appreciation as both had such friendly, assured dispositions. Disposition means attitude, personalities. Mackenzie knew that they had been taken care of. Uh, let me show you this illustration. Here's a, here's a pretty cool one. That's Mr. Mackenzie and the Labrador retrieving the duck at the pond. Oops, hold on, let me get back to my place. This made it all the harder to understand why they should be roaming such solitary and forbidding country, he admitted. See, it's obvious that these animals were kept by humans, and here they are hundreds of miles from and I heard some out the deep in the wilderness, uh, and that's hard to understand. But perhaps their owner had died, and they had run away together, or perhaps they had been lost from some car traveling across the country, and they were trying to make their way back to familiar territory. The possibilities were endless, and only one thing was certain, that they had been on the road a long time for the scars to heal and the quills to work, work their way inside a mouth, and long enough to know starvation. So, they could have come from a hundred miles away or more, said Mackenzie, from Manitoba, that's one of the provinces of Canada, even. I wonder what they can have lived on all that time. Hunting, scrounging at other farms, stealing perhaps, suggested Nell, who had watched with amusement in the kitchen mirror at her early morning visitors sliding a piece of bacon off a plate after breakfast when he thought her back had turned. <laughs> Well, the pickings must have been pretty lean, said her husband thoughtfully. The Labrador looks like a skeleton. He wouldn't have much, he wouldn't have got much farther. I'll shut them in the stable when I go to deep water. We don't want them wandering off again. Now, Nell, are you quite sure do you want to take on two strange dogs? It may be a long time before they trace, or it may never be. Oh, I want them, she said simply, for as long as they will stay. And in the meantime, we must find something else to call them besides high and good dog. <laughs> I'll think of something while you're away, she added, and I'll take some milk out to the stable during the morning. And from his sunny observation post on the wood pile, the cat had watched Mackenzie cross the yard and usher the two dogs into a warm, sweet-smelling stable, shutting their doors carefully behind him. Shortly afterward, the truck, the truck rattled down the farm road and all was quiet again. A few curious farm cats were emboldened to approach the woodpile, resenting, the, resenting this exotic stranger who had taken possession of their favorite sunning place. The stranger was not fond of other cats at the best of times, even his own breed, and farm cats were beyond the pale altogether. So Siamese cats are kind of the aristocracy, the royalty of the cat family in their own minds. They're very smart, very talkative, uh, and they kind of look down on the farm cats, even though that's not 
right because farm cats can be just as smart. You know, you, you guys know that uh, Mr. T and Mrs. Terrier, we have a Siamese cat, who's very smart, his name's Zuki, uh, and we have Mosby, and Mosby is just uh, uh, a found rescue black cat. Uh, and Mosby is very smart. You've seen him in some of the videos. And Zuki too. <clears throat> so the cat surveyed the farm cats ba balefully, you know, looking, uh, and considered his strategy. After two or three well-executed skirmishes, the band dispersed, and the black-masked pirate returned to his lair to sleep. Siamese cats have like a black face mask. Halfway through the morning, he awoke, stretched, and jumped down, looking warily around before stalking over to the stable door. He bleated plain, plaintively, we've heard that, uh, that, adjective, that adverb before, he bleated plaintively, and was, at, and was answered by a rustle of straw within. Leisurely, he gathered himself for a spring and then lep, leapt effortlessly at the latch on the door. But he was not quite quick enough and the latch remained in position. Latch is the door opener. Annoyed, unused to failure, he sprang again, this time making sure of success. For a split second, almost in the same impetus as the spring, one paw was curved around the wooden block handle, supporting its weight while the other paw reached the latch above and the door swung open. This is a cat that can open barn doors. Purring with restrained pleasure, the cat walked in, suffering a boisterous welcome from his old friend before investigating the empty bowl. Disappointed, he left the stable and the two dogs followed him out into the sunlit yard and disappeared into the hen house. Hen house is where they keep the chickens. This could be a problem. Several enraged and squawking fowls as the chickens rushed out as he made his way towards the nesting boxes. <laughs> Curving his paws expertly around a warm brown egg, he held it firmly and cracked it with a neat sideways tap of his long incisor tooth and, <clears throat> and the contents uh, settling intact on the straw. He had brought his art to brought his art to perfection after years of egg stealing. He lapped the delicate, unhurried thorough. He lapped, he lapped with delicate, unhurried thoroughness, helping himself to two or more before returning to his wood pile again. I thought he was going to eat the chickens, but he learned, this cat knows how to crack eggs and eat them. Pretty amazing. When Mackenzie drove into the farmyard later that later on in the afternoon, he was surprised to see the two dogs sleeping in the sun by the shelter of the cattle trough. They stood by the truck, wagging their tails in recognition as he unloaded and then followed them into the farmhouse. Wow, I thought they were gonna go they were gonna they were gonna go away. But I guess they realize now that the humans can take care of them. Did you let them out of the stable now? he asked opening a parcel at the kitchen table and sheepishly dropping a meaty bone into the shark-like mouth that had opened beside him. Of course not, she answered in surprise. I took them out some milk, but I remember being particularly careful to close the door. Perhaps the latch wasn't down properly, she said McKenzie. Anyway, they're still here. The latch face looks better already. Already, You'll be able to eat a decent meal by this evening, I hope. I'd like to get some meat on those bones. Nothing was known of the runaways in deep water, the, the small town, he reported, but they must have come from the east, for a mink breeder at Archer Creek had spoken of chasing a white dog off his doorstep the night before, mistaking it for a local white mongrel well known for its thieving ways. Most men thought the Labrador could have been lost from a hunting trip but nobody could account for an unlikely bull terrier as his companion. The Indian agent had offered to take the Labrador if nobody turned up to claim him, as his own hunting dog had recently died. Indeed, he will not, Nell said, broke in indignantly. Indignantly means uh, uh, upset. All right, said her husband, laughing. I told him we would never separate them, and of course, we'll keep them as long as we can. I'd hate to think of one of my own dogs running loose at this time of the year. But I warn you, Nell, that if they are heading somewhere with a purpose, nothing on earth will keep them here. Even if they're dropping on their feet, the instinct will pull them on. But Mackenzie knows something about dogs, doesn't he? 
All we can do is keep them shut in for a while and feed them up. Then, if they leave, at least it will have given them a better start. After supper that night, the Mackenzies and their guests moved into a little black room, into the little back room, a cozy, pleasantly shabby place, its shelves filled with children's books, tarnished trophies and photographs, while snowshoes, mounted fish, and grandchildren's drawings jostled one another for space on the walls with award ribbons, pedigrees, and a tomahawk. Mackenzie sat at the table, puffing peacefully on his pipe and working at the minute, intricate rigging of a model schooner. A schooner is a ship, a sailing ship uh, that he's building. He's building a model. Uh, while his wife read three men in a boat aloud to him. The replete, and satis the re replete and satisfied Labrador had eaten ravenously that evening, cleaning up bowls of fresh milk and plates of food with boundless appetite. Now he lay, he lay stretched full length under the table in the deep sleep of exhaustion and security. And the terrier snored gently from the depths of the old leather sofa, his head pillowed on a cushion, four paws in the air. <laughs> the only disturbance during the evening was the noise of a tremendous cat battle out in the yard. Both dogs sat up immediately and, to the astonishment of the elderly couple watching, Wag their tails in unison, wearing almost identical expressions of pleasure and doting interest. <laughs> Later on, they followed Mackenzie out quite willingly to the stable, where he piled some hay in the corner of a loose box for them, filled the bowl with water, and then shut the door firmly behind him, satisfying himself that the latch was down and firmly in place, and would remain so even when the door was rattled. Shortly afterward, the lights downstairs in the farmhouse went out, followed in a little while by the bedroom lights upstairs. The dogs lay quietly in the darkness waiting. So they were <clears throat> waiting. Soon there was a soft scrambling of paws on wood. The latch clicked again and the door opened a fraction, just enough to admit the slight body of the cat. He trampled and kneaded the hay for a while, purring in a deep rumble before curling up, curling up in a ball at the old dog's chest. There were several contented sighs, then silence reigned in the stable. When the young dog awoke in the cold hour before dawn, only, to, uh, only a few pale laggard stars were left to give the message which his heart already knew. It was time to go, time to press on westward. The yawning, stretching cat joined him at the stable door, then the old dog shivering in the cold dawn wind, and for a few minutes the three sat motionless, listening, looking out across the still dark farmyard where already they could hear the slight stirring of animals. It was a time to be gone. There were many miles to be traveled before the first, the first halt of the warmth of the sun. Silently, they crossed the yard and entered the fields leading to the dark, massed shadows of the trees in the farthermost corner, their paws making three sets of tracks in the light rime of frost that covered the field. And even as they turned onto the deer trail leading westward through the brush, brush a light came, up, came on upstairs in the farmhouse. Note the frost, that means winter's coming. Ahead of them lay the last 50 miles of the journey. Ooh, so for the first time we know that there's an end. It was as well that they had been fed and rested. Most of the way now lay through the Strandland Game Reserve, a country that was the most desolate and rugged, than any, that was more desolate and rugged than anything they had yet encountered. The nights would be frosty, the going perilous and exhausting. There could be no help expected from any human agency, because in a wildlife rest for use, humans don't live there. Worst of all, their leader was weak and unfit. That's the end of chapter nine. Hmm. So that was a helpful time with the Mackenzie Farm, at the Mackenzie Farm, but now they're back out, the trio are now back out on, on their own. Uh, here's a cool illustration, you can get to see the cat arguing with the farm cats. 
So we have 50 miles to go through the wilderness of the game preserve. So we'll see you next Friday to see what happens to our trio. Have a great weekend. Mr. T out.